question. What does Guat- Guatemala have in common with the Tuskegee syphilis experiments that led to that a major apology by the U.S. government? Well, let me just explain to you this story. On October 1st, 2010, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Seblius offered extensive apologies to Guatemala and to Hispanic residents of the United States for action taken by the U.S. Public Health Service after a study revealed that U.S. government medical researchers intentionally infected hundreds of people in Guatemala, including uh, those incarcerated and institutionalized mental patients with gonorrhea and syphilis without their knowledge or permission more than 60 years ago. Now, the records of this apparent research, quote-unquote, which took place uh, back in 1946 to 1948, were hidden. This experiment, of course, is similar to the infamous 40-year-long Tuskegee experiment in which hundreds of African-American men who believed they were being treated for syphilis were actually denied treatment. They were simply watching how syphilis would impact the body. Some of the same researchers were involved with what happened in Guatemala. Now, subsequently, the Obama administration announced plans to study new rules to protect human subjects and to allocate money to fight sexually transmitted diseases in Guatemala. Fast forward to 2011, when the U.S. Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues confirmed that um, the members of the U.S. medical team knew they were violating the rights of vulnerable populations in Guatemala, calling it, quote, a reprehensible exploitation of our fellow human beings, unquote. And yet, just as it was done with the Tuskegee victims, the U.S. government failed to provide any compensation to those it harmed. Never mind, actually, the fact that it's just criminal. How about that? And in fact, fast forward to January 9th, 2012, and the U.S. Department of Justice filed motions asking the court to dismiss the class action claim brought by the Guatemalan victims, and the U.S. government, the, D, uh, the U.S. DOG, wanted to claim immunity from that prosecution. Fast forward to March 9th of this year, where the Guatemalan victims of non-consensual human medical experimentation by the U.S. researchers filed their responses to the January 9th motion to dismiss by the U.S. government and Pan-American Health Organization, known as the PAHO. The plaintiffs, the victims, argue that the assertion of immunity by all defendants, i.e. the U.S. government and um, the Pan-American Health Organization, was not only morally disappointing, but legally wrong. As the Presidential Commission has firmly established both the U.S. medical authorities and the Pan-American Health Organization uh, were unquestionably involved in the medical experimentation that took place in Guatemala that used over 5,000 people and intentionally infected over 1,000 with venereal diseases, all without their consent. Now, those experiments unquestionably violate international law, both in its current form and, by the way, as it existed back then in the late 1940s. And so, therefore, any assertion of immunity, whether as an international organization or as a government, is totally wrong. Now, the plaintiffs are represented by Conrad and Shura LLP, and one of their attorneys, Piper Hendricks, who's just come back from Guatemala, joins us now. Piper, morning. Welcome to Wake Up Call. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me on the show. What another um, horror story from Tuskegee to um, Guatemala. Lay out how all of this came to be even um, known, given all the research was hidden to the extent that it was back in 46 to 48. Right. Yeah, no, it has been hidden for for decades, and it was just in the course of researching Tuskegee that a researcher, Professor um, Reverby up at Wellesley, discovered everything and looking through these records suddenly realized that this is not Tuskegee she was reading about but Guatemala which is something that people were not aware of at the time and so went through you know several steps to to bring it to the attention of authorities and that's where we got to October 2010 with President Obama and Secretaries Clinton and Sebelius apologizing publicly. So it was really a shock to everyone. I mean, I think that people are familiar with the tragedy of Tuskegee, but to realize that there was more to it than that, and as you noted, that people were being intentionally infected with disease rather than being watched as the the disease took over their bodies. I mean, they're they're both extremely gruesome, but this just takes it to another level that we hadn't been aware of before. And so our organization, um, I work with Conrad and Shear and also International Rights Advocates, um, work in conjunction in our D.C. office 
learned about this. We do a lot of work in Latin America. And so when people heard about this, they came to us and said, you know, can you file a case on our behalf? And that's something that we we did. We initially actually approached the government hoping that there might be a way that we could settle out of court because it's been kind of a challenge for us, you know, both wanting to see justice, but also it's it's really shameful what our, our government did. So we were hoping that they might be willing to, to talk out of court before we took that step of filing the case. But having received no response, we then filed the case in March of last year and got things rolling for the class action. And I mean, to, to some extent, the fact of the apology is an admission of um, of guilt. So the idea that they would then set up a commission to um, explore this when they already have precedent through Tuskegee is just a it's just a bit rich to say the to say the least. Um, so it, mm-hmm. yeah, no, we 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 wondered about that, but um, agreed to to toll the case for a bit, waiting for the results of the commission. I think that it, on one hand, that there is a positive up there and wanting to really be clear about what happened and review. What's remarkable in this case is we have so many records that Dr. Cutler kept of, of the experiments. And so with the, the issue of the commission report, I mean, if there were ever any doubt, which, you know, as we know, there was not before, this really clarifies exactly what happened. And then you're right, the assertion of immunity after that is extremely disappointing. And so then lay out the um, class action um, suit. And then also that since there has been an apology, which isn't that an admission of guilt even within a court of law? And then doesn't that mean to some extent the class action suit is to some degree won? In, in a sense, you're right. That there is definitely an admission of guilt. The, the difference here is that the defendant we're looking at being the U.S. government makes things a little bit trickier than you might have with any other defendant in court. Right. There's so- sovereign immunity is what they've asserted here, and, and basically the government can't be sued unless the government gives you permission to sue it, which is is a, a sticky thing in, in this sort of issue, um, especially when we're dealing with, with violations of international law. We brought the case on behalf of a, a large group of plaintiffs. As you mentioned, there were 5,000 people who were involved in these experiments, and a 1,000 who were intentionally infected with venereal diseases. And the record showed that none of them were gave consent to, to participate in these experiments. Quite often the researchers would go to the institution instead and ask the prison officials for permission to, to experiment with their prisoners or the orphanage um, directors for permission to experiment with the orphans. And whether or not people who were giving even that limited permission, which obviously is not valid when you're like, dealing with medical issues, it wasn't clear that they knew exactly what was going on, that there were, you know, were these people giving free medical care or were they, you know, intentionally infecting people with venereal diseases? It, it, there's not an indication that, that they were aware of, of actually what was going on. And and so we brought the ca- a, um, case on behalf of both the individual victims themselves and their families because this is given the type of disease that we're, we're talking about here. These are things that can be easily transmitted that later to spouses or to families. And even, as you mentioned, I just returned from Guatemala, even in cases where it's not transmitted to a spouse, there's still a devastating impact on that family. And that's something that I saw meeting with one of the clients recently who did not, thankfully, um, transmit everything that he had to his wife. But the impact that that had on his relationship, I mean, he did not want to have children for fear that he would transmit this to her. And it's, it's a shameful thing. It's not like having the flu. I mean, venereal diseases have a stigma now just as they did in back when these experiments were taking place. And so it really is traumatic. He mentioned that there were people within his unit from the, the military who later committed suicide for the shame of, of what they'd gone through and what they were carrying around in their bodies then. Uh, wow, it's just, it's just such a, such a horror story. And to, to know that Tuskegee happened was its own shock to now hear about mm-hmm. uh, Guatemala as well. It's its own, own shock. And I'm listening to you in the early part of that answer where you said that you can't bring it, you can't sue the U.S. government unless the government gives you permission to sue it. <laughs> Whatever, what kind of law, what kind of court of law does that ever happen to? Who gives you permission <laughs> does, to sue them? That's the most bizarre. ridiculous thing I've ever heard. There's some waivers of immunity in, in certain cases. Um, looking more, you know, when has a government employee acted within the scope of, of their employment or not, and, and, you know, different waivers. But in this case, what we're arguing is that when you've got violations of international law, you know, that rises above any sort of immunity that, that you should assert. Absolutely. Um, 
And with the, the Pan American Health Organization, they asserted international organizational immunity. And again, you, if you look at the, the cases in which this, this defense was asserted, quite often it, it's in employment cases. And the, the argument there is that an international organization shouldn't have to deal with it, the courts of every single country where it's located when people say, you know, I didn't, I wasn't paid my overtime or I'm suing a spouse um, after a divorce and I want to garnish wages and, and things that just, in when you look at them in context, you think, okay, this is something that, that no domestic court needs to meddle in because, it, you know, we just need the international organizations to run smoothly. But in this sort of thing, when the entire, the, the law of nations agrees, I mean, look at Nuremberg, the entire world said this, this type of experimentation without consent of the people who are participating is abhorrent. We all agree that this cannot happen. And so to assert immunity in a case like this is, is really, really quite offensive. And, it, you know, the, we are looking at it in both the, the legal context, you know, there's the, the legal case that we're, we're battling, but then there's also more the, the court of, of public opinion and the, the other remedies that might be available and really hoping that the government might step outside of the legal context and say, hey, look, we might have this defense available, but we recognize that this is something that was wrong to do and that individual people who were involved deserve a remedy. And that's something that I, I recognize listeners might think, ah, this is a plaintiff's attorney, you know, she has an interest in saying this. What's been very encouraging to us is to hear the same thing from bioethicists, from editorial boards of different newspapers. I mean, people know when you, and actually from the commission itself, that there's different um, committees who have looked at this and said, when you participate in medical experimentation, you are taking a risk on behalf of all of society, saying, hey, I might be harmed in the course of this, but I'm willing to take on that risk for the betterment of everyone else. And if something happens, and I deserve some sort of remedy because I've taken on the risk that everyone else won't have to take, hopefully in the course of finding um, a cure to whatever it is that they're, um, they're researching, something that will better everyone's life. But it's just it, that's, that's the, the calculus that you take in these, in these sorts of experiments to keep everything fair. And in this case, people weren't given that opportunity to opt in. But now that they've been harmed, it's just simply fair and ethical to... to reimburse them for that, it, which is, is a complicated thing. Obviously, we recognize that no amount of money will ever undo everything that happened, but it's a start. When there's nothing else that you can do, that's, that's where you start. And, and to say, we're only giving you an apology and that's it, is really, it, it's offensive. You know, and sorry does not equal um, justice. And the idea um, um, that um, you could literally put innocent people at that kind of risk and mm -hmm. on the, so there's the first there's the violation of people's bodies in terms of the um, them being subject to the experimentation in the first place so there's that violation and then there's the consequences of them being um, left uh, infected and untreated and the health consequences of that and then there's the familial uh, what happens within the family you talked about incidences where people from the shame took their own lives I mean there have been several mm -hmm. consequences that are as a result of the criminal behavior of a US government and the idea that an apology would be enough and that you could offer you could expect immunity from um, action is extraordinary even though the US consistently doesn't sign up to um, international law and considers itself immune from international law in so many um, um, ways. And so before we close, uh, Piper, what are the next steps for this um, um, case, which we have to continue to follow because, I mean, it's just such a shock to even discover that this was the case. It's, tr it's true. I think people aren't aware that, that this happened and aren't aware that there's, there's still an ongoing question, which is really a shame. Here we are decades later and there are still experiments going on around the world where whether or not there's actually been consent of the people involved is questionable. And so for both the people who are, are in current day experiments and also the people who were, were victimized in Guatemala, we are continuing this, this fight and wanting to raise awareness. And there's, there's three ways that your listeners can help us with that. We have a change.org petition um, that's entitled Fair Compensation for Guatemalan Victims of U.S. Medical Experimentation. If they would go to that change.org petition, add their signature, add their voice, it would be really powerful. Um, we also have a Facebook page where they can go and click like and, and get our updates there. And one thing that we've got there that's helpful is a letter that they can use to write to members of Congress. If you go to congress.org, there's an area where you can communicate with Congress and send something to your representatives. 
And that is really important. I know that, that it's easy in a lot of causes to say, oh, write your representatives and, and raise awareness. Here, we've gotten in no uncertain terms that if people were to hear, if representatives were to hear from, from their constituents, they'd be more inclined to take action. There's a lot of issues going on. We all know that right now. And so getting awareness of one that has been marginalized because of how long it's been since these experiments took place has been a challenge. But if your listeners can help us in that and really tell people, tell our representatives, tell the legislature, we want a remedy. Don't make this any different than Tuskegee. We apologize for people and provided a remedy for those that we experimented on in our own country. We need to do the same on a national stage. It would be incredibly helpful. Piper Hendricks, associate uh, uh, attorney at Conrad and Shera, and an attorney who's just returned from Guatemala representing the, uh, the plaintiffs in this class action suit. We will absolutely continue to follow this story. But thank you so much for now. Thank you, Piper.